Okay. Uh, hello. Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the second talk of this session. It is my great pleasure to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Le Dr. Jan Michael Peters. He obtained his PhD from University of Heidelberg, during which uh, he discovered the P97 ATPase and structurally structurally characterized the 26S proteasome. As a postdoctoral postdoctoral fellow at Harvard Medical School, he discovered the anaphase promoting complex and associ associated enzymes that are involved in the cell division. Uh, in 2013, he became the scientific director of the Un Institute of Molecular Pathology in Vienna. Uh, his lab is studying molecular mechanisms of genome architecture and chromosomal segregation in mammalian cells. He is author on over 170 publications, has received numerous awards, including the Wittgenstein Prize and has coordinated several large scale research projects such as European Union projects, MitoCheck and Mitosis. Uh, today in his talk, he will enlighten us on how cohesion can mediate 3D folding of the genome by forming chromatin loops and topologically associating domains. With this, I would now welcome Dr. Peters to our virtual stage and we are looking forward to hearing your talk. The stage is all yours. Thank you very much, Debojit. Uh, hello, everybody. I hope you can hear and see me. Uh, a big thanks to the organizing committee in Göttingen uh, for inviting me. Uh, I've been in Göttingen many times, both for collaboration visits uh, and also to give talks. And each of these visits has been a great pleasure. It's a real shame, therefore, that this year we can't meet in person. But it's great that you've taken the initiative to have the Horizons uh, conference anyway online so that we can all continue discussing our science uh, during the pandemic. I have been there at the Horizons conference, I think, exactly 10 years ago in person. Um, and I'm very happy to be part of it again uh, this year. Uh, as Dibujit mentioned, I would like to tell you how we think uh, genomic DNA is folded inside uh, our cell nuclei in chromatin by the cohesion complex. And I'll start sharing my screen. Uh, just a moment. Dibujit, can that be seen now? It Dibujit, takes a little see? while. Yeah, it takes a little while to load the slides, but right. yeah, now it's loading. So we would, yeah. Okay, I hope everybody can see my slides. Uh, yes, as both Debajit and I mentioned, I would like to discuss how cohesion folds genomic DNA. And I would like to start by reminding you of something that I'm sure you're all well aware of, namely that each of our diploid cells contains a large amount of DNA uh, amounting to two meters in the 46 chromosomes that our cells contain. Uh, but that some other species even have large amounts of DNA, even bigger genomes. Uh, a really surprising example is the axolotl, which in its also, of course, microscopically small cell nuclei contains uh, 20 meters of DNA. Now, from these numbers alone, uh, it's obvious that DNA has to exist in a highly folded state uh, in cell nuclei and in mitotic and meiotic chromosomes. Uh, but uh, it's important to note that uh, the folding of DNA uh, is not only occurring so that uh, DNA can be fit into cell nuclei, but serves a number of important structural and regulatory functions, and that it is not a passive and stochastic process, but is mediated uh, in a regulated fashion uh, actively by enzymes such as cohesin, and re related uh, complexes uh, in mitosis, for example, the condensing complex. Um, we believe that these folding processes, as I mentioned, serve a number of functions. Uh, one of them, which has been discussed for decades in the literature, is that regulatory DNA sequences need to be into, need to be brought into proximity of gene promoters to be able to activate them. Uh, uh, this is the famous enhancer function. That is thought to occur by looping of chromatin fibers. Uh, likewise, when different gene segments are to be recombined, as is, for example, the case in developing B and T cells of the immune system, in which immunoglobulin genes are heavily rearranged so that a broad repertoire of T cell receptors, B cell receptors, and antibodies can be generated. 
Um, that recombination process also uh, strictly depends on the folding of chromatin fibers so that gene segments that are to be recombined can be brought into proximity. And then finally, the compaction of chromatin into mitotic and meiotic chromosomes is also thought to uh, at least in part be achieved by the formation of exceptionally long chromatin loops. Uh, and then maybe that's less obvious, but it's also thought that chromatin folding uh, has an important role in separating replicated DNA molecules. That's a concept that has emerged from studies of bacterial cell division, where the circular bacterial genome is being uh, replicated and segregated at the same time. And that segregation process is thought to be achieved by reeling the newly emerging sister DNA molecules into loops, which would then automatically separate the two sister DNA molecules from each other, as is very uh, schematically illustrated here. So for these reasons, we think that understanding how genomic DNA is folded into loops uh, is interesting and important. Um, and of course, that requires good assays to visualize this process. Now, this can be achieved at the single mode, at the single cell level by microscopy techniques, um, but typically only for one or a few loci at the same time, and at least in most imaging uh, technologies also with a limited resolution. But it turns out that one can detect uh, chromatin interactions in cis, a genome-wide, also by sequencing technologies uh, such as HI-C, uh, in which sequences that are in close proximity uh, in situ, so inside cell nuclei, uh, are chemically crosslinked to each other. Uh, the genomic DNA is then fragmented, and the pieces that have been crosslinked to each other can be enriched and then be identified by DNA sequencing. And uh, these interactions can then be visualized in heat maps as, as is uh, an example shown here, where both on the Y and the X axis, you are plotting a particular genomic uh, region and then can visualize whether a particular sequence, let's say this sequence A here or locus A, interacts with other sequences. And you can see from this dot here that in this particular experiment, uh, sequence A must have been interacting with sequence B uh, because that's why you get uh, such a high C um, signal here. What you can also see is that typically in these high C maps, uh, there is a strong signal along the diagonal, and that is simply reflecting the fact that sequences which are in close proximity uh, in the linear genome, of course, have a high propensity to being crosslinked. But then you can see not just this example here, but many others where you have signals away from the diagonal. And many of these appear in these pyramid-like uh, shapes, uh, which are referred to as topologically associating domains, where many sequences appear to interact with each other, at least at the level of cell populations. These experiments are typically performed with millions of cells. So every interaction that is being sequenced and detected here might only have occurred in some of the cells and not all of them. And so some of these touch structures are believed to be population phenomena, where at the single cell level, maybe only some of these interactions existed, which then would also very schematically um, exist as such cis loops as they are shown here. Now, many years back, my lab uh, speculated, it was really speculation at the time, that one protein complex that could have an important role in forming such chromatin loops could be the cohesin complex. Um, based on uh, the observation which we had made at the time that these cohesin complexes are enriched in the genome at sites that are bound by DNA binding protein, which is called CTCF, which binds to specific sequences um, in the genome, and which had been implicated at the time already in forming cis loops. And so based on this colocalization, we hypothesized that perhaps it's the cohesin complex that forms these loops holds their anchors together, so to say, but uh, that the site at which these loops will be formed will be specified by CTCF as a sequence-specific DNA binding protein. Now, at the time, that was an unusual thought because cohesin had been discovered initially 
uh, as a protein complex that's essential for holding two different DNA molecules together, uh, the sister chromatids that are formed by DNA replication, uh, to build what is called sister chromatid cohesion, uh, a physical connection between replicated DNA molecules that is essential for proper segregation of chromosomes, both in mitosis and meiosis. And this sister chromatid cohesion is believed to be mediated by cohesin complexes by entrapping the two sister DNA molecules, schematically shown here, inside a ring structure that is formed by three of cohesin subunits. These are very large cord coil containing subunits, as, as I've shown in this cartoon here, that are connected by a third subunit down here. And these three together form rings, which are believed to entrap the DNA uh, or the DNA molecules to build cohesion. Now this process, because it's essential for cell division, um, has been studied in great detail and two concepts have emerged from these studies of sister chromatic cohesion, which are summarized here. One is that unlike most other DNA binding proteins, it's believed that cohesion, or was believed, that cohesion could not simply spontaneously associate with DNA but that this would be a highly regulated process, which requires two other components, namely an ATPase activity that's intrinsic to cohesin, and that is encoded by or catalyzed by these two large subunits, which I mentioned already, which are called SMC1 and SMC3, which have ATP binding and hydrolyzing domains, <coughs> excuse me, down here. And that this loading process of cohesin onto DNA would also depend on a separate protein complex which has two subunits called NLPBL and NO2. And as I mentioned, the product of this loading reaction is thought to be a topologically entrapped uh, situation where cohesin like a carabiner would passively connect two DNA molecules in front. Now, subsequent to that, my, to that, my lab discovered that Cohesin can also be released by an active process from DNA, and that requires a different heterodimeric protein complex, which contains the WACL protein and a protein called PDS5. And I will come back to both NRPDL and PDS5 proteins later in my talk. Now, our idea that cohesin might also be needed to mediate cis contacts, not only trans, uh, as in cohesion, um, has been supported by two observations. Uh, one in which we and others induced degradation of a cohesion subunit by the auxin system, and then asked what would the consequence of that be for high C detected uh, cis interactions. And as you can see in this example, if one induces degradation of cohesion, already 15 minutes after that, uh, loops and tads become much less detectable and then at later time points become completely in, undetectable, indicating that cohesin is indeed required for these cis interactions that are false or that represent genomic folding in interface chromatin. Uh, the other observation that supported this idea came from experiments in which we studied the cellular functions of the release factor WACL, which I mentioned briefly. Um, and in these experiments, we made two observations which we hadn't expected, uh, which, however, implied indeed that cohesin must have an important role in chromatin structure. Uh, one observation was that when we depleted WACO, we found that now interface uh, chromatin, simply stained here uh, by DAPI for DNA, becomes more compact, as if these cells had entered mitosis, which they clearly hadn't. And even more surprisingly, that the localization of cohesin itself changed. Normally you can detect cohesin by fluorescent microscopy relatively evenly distributed on chromatin, as you see here in this example. But if the release factor WAPL is depleted, and now cohesin for that reason has a longer residence time on chromatin, just stays bound there for longer periods, now cohesin accumulates in axial structures, which are present in chromosome territories which from fish experiments we know run from one telomere to the other. And when we observed this, uh, we hypothesized that both these phenotypes could be explained 
if one assumes that Gleason forms exceptionally long loops under these conditions, and uh, different Gleason complexes would accumulate at the base of these loops. And this accumulation would then be microscopically visible as accumulation in these axial domains. Very similar to how condensing complexes in mitotic and meiotic chromosomes are also known to accumulate in axial structures uh, of these chromosomes. And the student who discovered these, uh, these worm-like structures was Italian or is Italian, Antonio Tedeschi, and decided to call them little worms in Italian or vermicelli, which is what we still refer to them uh, today. Now, what we could not explain is why depletion of buckle and the resulting increase in cohesion's residence time would cause these dramatic changes. And that was really first explained by a polymer physicist uh, at MIT in Boston, Leonid Mirny, who realized that these phenotypes could be explained if one assumed that chromatin loops were formed by an extrusion process. This so-called loop extrusion hypothesis has been proposed multiple times independently by different investigators to explain how distant loci can be brought into proximity by looping. And it assumes that the cell contains so-called loop extrusion factors, which could be cohesin or condensin, but initially, of course, it was unknown what they could be, which would bind to DNA and then by an unknown mechanism, real flanking DNA sequences into loop structures as is schematically shown here. And if cohesin was able to do this, it will be obvious that it's released from DNA by wattle, which happens every couple of minutes normally, we think, would dissolve these loops and would thereby limit their lifetime and their length. But if wattle was inactivated, which is what we had done experimentally, then one would predict that now cohesin would form longer loops because it stays on chromatin much longer. Um, and eventually, neighboring cohesin complexes would run into each other, which could explain why they would accumulate in these central domains, the vermicelli of interface chromosome characters. And so that was a very exciting idea because it could explain the phenotypes we had seen. And by doing so, provided some of the first evidence for the loop exclusion hypothesis, which up until then had been purely hypothetical, and also for that reason was quite controversial and was not accepted by many people uh, in the field. It was also important because it made uh, a number of predictions that now could be experimentally tested. I will just show you one example. As is schematically shown here, the pred one prediction is that wattle depletion would increase the length of chromatin loops. And indeed, that is exactly what one can see in high C experiments if one analyzes, um, using the technique I described, uh, cis interactions in control cells, one sees these typical tuts and loops. But if one does the very same experiments in cells depleted of wattle, we're looking at the same genomic region here in mouse cells lacking the WAPL gene, uh, blocks out by recombination. Now we can see many more long range contacts further away from the diagonal, representing very long loops that would normally not be detectable in large heart cells, exactly as predicted by the loop extrusion hypothesis. So that was exciting because it did uh, provide indirect but strong evidence for the idea that chromatin loops are folded actively by cohesion, by loop extrusion. But direct evidence for this idea uh, has been missing for a long time. Uh, until two years ago, uh, Kay Stecker at University of Delft and Kristen Hearing at EMBL discovered that a preparation of budding yeast condensin, condensin being a complex that's related to cohesin, which is thought to mediate DNA looping in mitosis and meiosis, uh, can in vitro indeed fold linear DNA molecules shown here into loop-like structures uh, shown here uh, by sitting at the base of these loops. And so that was the first direct demonstration that members of the so-called SMC family of protein complexes to which cohesin and condensin belong can at least in vitro in a purified system mediate such a looping process. Now that was really exciting for us because it did imply that maybe that would be exactly also how cohesion would form loops 
And Ian Davidson at the postdoc in my lab decided to test this idea by using an in vitro assay, which he had developed before, which I think I actually have presented the previous talks in Göttingen before we have these results though, in which we are tethering very long DNA molecules, lambda phage genomes uh, typically, uh, at both of their ends to a glass surface in a uh, microscopic flow chamber and then flow buffer through this chamber while we're imaging. Um, the buffer, as you will see, will stretch this piece of DNA, uh, which we visualize by a DNA dye such as cytox orange. And then with the buffer flow, Ian can flow in different proteins of interest, such as cohesin complexes, to ask would they now alter the structure of these DNA molecules? Uh, specifically, would they form loops, as is schematically shown here, and as had been seen for budding yeast for dancing. And I show you what Ian saw for a long period of time, many months, um, namely that the buffer would stretch now a single DNA molecule, which is attached here and here. Uh, and when he flowed in cohesin and ATP, nothing else would happen. And he looked at hundreds of these molecules and very clearly cohesin and ATP alone were never sufficient to do anything to the DNA structure, as you see. Now, in these cases, we initially used very common versions of cohesin made in insect cells. And so, of course, it could have been that these recombinant complexes differed from endogenous cohesin in some way. Um, but when we used uh, cohesin purified from human cultured cells, HeLa in this case, again, no DNA looping was uh, seen. So that indicated that cohesin either could not perform loop extrusion or was not sufficient to do it. And at this point, I have to remind you that indeed, uh, as I mentioned, the loop extrusion hypothesis was initially controversial and even remained so when Decker and Herring had discovered uh, loop extrusion by budding yeast condensin. Uh, and some of the um, questions that were raised uh, for, are listed here, for example, whether that could have been an elite artifact of using naked DNA, or whether it could have been caused by a contamination in the budding yeast condensin prep or since our negative uh, results were negative, whether perhaps condensin could mediate this process, but not cohesin, or whether cohesin's ATP activity might perhaps be too weak to carry out such a process. Um, but uh, we reasoned that there could be other differences of cause, namely that maybe we are missing an essential component. And that seemed possible because if one purifies condensin complexes, schematically shown on the left, uh, it turns out that these contain five subunits, uh, three ring forming subunits and then two additional ones then bind to a so-called Kleisen subunit that's connecting the ATPase heads uh, of the SMC subunits. But if one purifies cohesin, you will only find four subunits. So these are tetramers, where only one protein is bound to the Kleisen, which in somatic cells can be either stack one or stack two, but never both of them at the same time. But what was really interesting was that uh, we knew that cohesin, as I mentioned, is uh, controlled in its ability to bind to DNA by two complexes, a, a putative loading complex and a putative release complex. And each of these uh, also contain proteins that are related to these Kleisen binding proteins and that they are heat repeat proteins. And for both of these, in the NRPBL and PDS5, there was already evidence that they could also at least transiently associate with the Kleisen subunit of cohesin. So for that reason, we decided to test whether they would enable cohesin to form, to form with extrusion. And for that reason, Ian generated recombinant versions of PDS5 proteins, of which two exist in human cells, called A and B, very large molecular mass proteins. But when they were added to cohesin, still no looping occurred, as you see here in this graph or here in these stills from the video. But when Ian generated uh, recombinant versions of the putative loading complex containing the heat repeat protein NRPBL and NO2, then what he saw was that now DNA loops were formed very efficiently and rapidly, as you can see in this movie, um, and also in this um, larger microscopic field where you can see that many of the doubly tethered DNA molecules are converted into loop-like structures over time. Uh, that's quantified in this histogram. As I told you, cohesin alone will never form any loops. 
Um, so I remember you have to unfold them and stop that. Um, and addition of PDS5 A and B will also not allow cohesion to form loops, but the addition of NRPBL module will. Uh, in, in this particular case, 45% of all DNA modules um, analyzed. And the resulting structures are indeed uh, loops. They're not recombination products, we think. They're not stem loops. Because if one looks carefully, one can see that they're connected at the base, but not at the arms. And if one uses very mild uh, paraform allied fixation conditions, one can see this even more clearly, as you see here, where you clearly have a loop structure that is connected only at the base. Now, these structures are formed symmetrically, means both arms are forming at the same rate. That's different from what has been seen for budding these condensin, which forms these loops asymmetrically. Uh, these loops are formed in a process that is strictly dependent on cohesion's ability to bind and hydrolyze ATP. So it's driven by the ATP activity of cohesion. And they form quite fast uh, at rates of up to 2.1 kb per second under our in vitro uh, conditions. Now, these uh, processes are not an artifact of applying buffer flow, which is what we typically apply in these experiments, because we can switch off the buffer flow. Then one cannot directly see the extended DNA molecule and also no loops forming initially, but instead one sees uh, densely stained uh, structures, globular structures occurring on these tether DNA molecules over time. And if then, after that, one applies buffer flow, you can see that these can be resolved into these loop-like structures. So their formation does not depend on physical force uh, that would push the DNA into this particular configuration. Uh, and very importantly, if one looks where cohesion is located during this looping process, uh, one can see that it's sitting all the time at the base of the forming loop. And that's shown here. Uh, that's difficult to image because the cohesion signals are very dim, but I hope you can see, in particular at the merge, that they are sitting at the base of the loops, which means that cohesion is actually in these experiments moving against the buffer flow. So it's not that cohesion will be pushed by the buffer flow, but it's actually moving while the loop becomes shorter, the base becomes closer to this end, into this direction, against the buffer flow. And that is uh, exactly what had been, for hypothetical or theoretical reasons, been proposed to occur during uh, loop extrusion by the loop extrusion hypothesis. That there would be a factor sitting at, on the DNA that would actively form a loop while sitting at the base of this structure. Now, I told you that the secret here was uh, to not only use cohesion and ATP, but uh, what was thought to be the loading complex, NLPBL mo 2 Now that, of course, could have been a completely trivial result because I told you that from many years of studying the cohesion function of cohesion, the concept had emerged that the loading of cohesion onto DNA is an active and regulated process that requires both the ATPase activity of cohesion and this complex of NLPBL mo 2 so maybe these two things were only needed for loop extrusion, because otherwise cohesion wouldn't even go on to DNA. Now to test this possibility, Ian uh, modified his loop extrusion assay by allowing uh, the three uh, required components, cohesion, NRPBL2 and ATP to be present so that loops could be formed, but then by exchanging the content of these microscopy chambers, by flowing these things out and replacing them with mixtures that would now only have a subset of the ingredients. So we would leave out, for example, cohesion and ask, would the loops be maintained or would they fall apart? And when we did this for cohesion, we found that even in the absence of cohesion, all loops, practically all loops that's quantified here, uh, were maintained indicating that once cohesion has formed the loop and sits at its base, uh, it doesn't need to be replaced by, or is not replaced by soluble cohesion. But when we performed the same experiments by leaving out NRPBL, now all the loops would fall apart, as is quantified here. 
indicating that NLPBO is needed to maintain these loops, presumably because its interaction with reason is relatively short-lived, and therefore it needs to constantly be exchanged by soluble NLPBO. And a similar result was obtained when we replaced ATP by CTP, which cannot be bound and hydrolyzed by cohesin. Then also all the loops fell apart. This is quantified here, implying that not only in a PBL, but also continued ATP binding and hydrolysis are needed to maintain these loops. And so these results, we think, imply that uh, in a PBL and ATP are not only needed to get cohesin onto DNA, but I needed throughout the process of loop formation and maintenance um, to, to uh, allow these processes to occur. And that interpretation is supported by the finding that NRPBL is also sitting at the base of the loops, exactly where we saw cohesin, as is shown here, as if it together with cohesin forms a polar complex uh, that is now able to perform loop extrusion, um, whereas cohesin on DNA alone would not be able to do this. And in this context, it's also very interesting to note that it's known, uh, first shown by Frank Ullman and colleagues, that NLPBL greatly stimulates the cohesion, uh, the ATPase activity of cohesion, about 30-fold in human proteins, uh, which is again consistent with the idea that it's an activator of the motor code and code of cohesion that then drives the cohesion. So uh, what we conclude from these observations is that NAPBL mo 2 is clearly not only a loading factor for cohesin, but is required for the process of lipid extrusion per se. And it will be an interesting question to ask whether it's NAPBL is needed for the loading reaction at all or not, or maybe is a processivity factor that keeps cohesin on DNA during lipid extrusion. And also that cohesin is not only a passive topological linker, which is thought uh, which is a start to be during sister chromatic cohesion, but clearly um, a motor protein that can actively move and fold um, DNA into loops. And similar conclusions have been reached by Hamtel Yu um, in Texas and Jan Brick in um, Dresden. Now, um, Dibujit, how much time do I have left? I have a couple more slides. Do we have time for these or should I uh, finish? We'll have three more minutes. We can go through some of the... Okay, some of great. The we'll, make, we'll use these minutes efficiently. Thank you. So I mentioned initially that uh, based on 20 years of studying the role of cohesin in sister community cohesion, it has been concluded that cohesin mediates cohesion by topologically entrapping DNA molecules inside its ring structure. And uh, based on that uh, so-called ring model, uh, it was obviously an interesting question for us to ask whether cohesin would interact with DNA in the same topological fashion when it performs loop extrusion. And to be able to test this, we created a version of cohesin in which all three interfaces of the three ring forming subunits are covalently linked so that they cannot be dissociated which would then not allow cohesin to entrap DNA inside this ring structure. And uh, this uh, was done by another postdoc in the lab, Benedict Bauer, who uh, made a really remarkable version of cohesin, which we call single chain cohesin, in which the three ring forming subunits are, are covalently fused into a single uh, polypeptide, and more than 300, uh, I think 369 kilodalton in mass and in which all cysteine residues in these three subunits were mutated. And uh, Benedict then introduced two new cysteine residues in this domain called the hinge, uh, so that he could use cross-linking by BOME to physically connect these, or covalently, sorry, and close these. And this cross-linking uh, step works uh, relatively efficiently with about 80% efficiency, as one can see in this gel shift. Remarkably, these closed and cross-linked complexes look by rotary shadow EM undistinguishable from wild type and even have the same ATPase activity as wild type cohesion, which uh, I find remarkable. Um, they alone, however, cannot perform loop extrusion unless one adds the fourth subunit stack one and of course NLPBL, as I told you. Uh, 
but uh, then without cross-linking, they can form, perform loop extrusion as well as wildcat cohesion. And so then the question was, if we now cross-link the one subunit interface that could still be opened and closed to entrap DNA topologically, would that now stop loop exclusion, um, as it would be predicted to prevent sister chromatic cohesion? And to our surprise, that's not the case. Uh, these complexes form loops as efficiently as wild-type cohesion. And that's not, we think, because there is a small fraction of complexes that were not crossing, because if we dilute down these crosslink preparations um, to what would be equivalent to the concentration of the non crosslink version here, then we see practically no loop So what these experiments imply is that the loop extrusion process uh, can occur under conditions where the cohesion ring is not entrapping DNA. So in summary, our re results uh, argue that um, dimers are not needed um, because we see, based on photo bleaching, that single monomeric cohesion complexes can perform with exclusion. Uh, and we also don't think that the classical ring model uh, or the classical ring entrapment state is needed for loop extrusion. Um, however, what is possible is that DNA will be threaded through the cohesion ring from the side, like you can thread the uh, something through the eye of a needle, as you see here schematically, um, and that would then result in formation of a loop. But it's also possible that cohesion would simply bind to DNA somehow without any form of entrapment, and then move the DNA by an unknown mechanism to form loops. Now, these observations are exciting because they provide direct evidence for the idea that genome folding, which was known to depend on cohesion, is mediated by loop extrusion. But they also raise numerous questions to which we have no answers, but to which we would really love to have answers. Uh, one of them is how does loop extrusion occur in cells where, of course, DNA is, is not present in a naked form, but bound to histones and many other DNA binding proteins. So the question is how would cohesion fold chromatin fibers? That's a key question in the field, I think. Then, of course, it will be very interesting to understand how this process directly relates to some of the functions I've mentioned in my introduction, and hence the promoter interactions, uh, recombination and immunoglobulin genes, uh, separation of sister chromatids. Uh, Along the same lines, we would like to understand how this process is controlled. In particular, what determines whether a cohesion complex performs loop extrusion or becomes cohesive during DNA replication. And that's very close to our heart, by what mechanism does cohesion real DNA into loops? Does it function like cytoskeletal proteins who work on uh, filaments? Um, is it a ratchet? Uh, what exactly does it do to form these loops? And so for all these uh, exciting projects, we are looking for new students and postdocs in case you are interested. Uh, and I also would like to mention that all of this work has been performed at the IMP in Vienna, uh, at the Vi Vienna Bio Center, uh, which is a great campus to do basic research. Sorry for going a bit over time, but I hope we will still have time for a few questions. And I'll finish by showing my acknowledgement slide. Special thanks to Ian Davidson and Benedict Bauer, who are really responsible for all the experiments I showed today. And many thanks to everybody else who worked with us on other projects listed here and our generous funding uh, sources. And many thanks for you for your interest and, and, and uh, attention. Okay, Thank I'll you. leave and I stop sharing so yeah. that hopefully people can see me. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the amazing talk again. Uh, now we can move on to the questions. Uh, yeah, so the most upvoted question is from Sebastian. He asks, uh, is it possible to identify sister chromatid contacts mediated by cohesion using high C? Yes, it's a great question. And the answer is yes. Uh, that's based on work not done in my lab, but on very recent work done by Daniel Gerlich at IMBA, also here in Vienna, uh, in collaboration with us. 
and also done on recent work done by Job Decker in Massachusetts. Uh, uh, Job's lab has used budding yeast, Daniel's lab HeLa cells uh, to develop high C techniques which have the ability to distinguish the two uh, sister DNA molecules which are of course chemically identical. Um, and uh, Daniel's manuscript, I think both manuscripts are on bioarchive. So for the, for the mammalian study, if you type in Mikael Mitter, he's the first author, Daniel Gali, you will find the bioarchive description of this so-called sister chromatid sensitive high C technology, which allows you to simultaneously identify both cis contacts, so the loops and tabs I talked about, and trans contacts in G2 phase, so cystic chromatid cohesion. The next question is from Yaji. She asks, "Is it? It is believed that cohesin extrudes uh, loops until it encounters convergent CTCF, which demonstrates okay. how CTCF-mediated loops are formed. Then, how how to explain loop formation at non-convergent CTCF anchors?" Yeah, thanks for asking that question. I, for time reasons, I didn't talk about CTCF much, but it's completely correct what you say, namely that surprisingly. Um, CTCF sites are found almost always in a convergent orientation at loop anchors. That was another mysterious phenomenon of genome architecture that could only be explained once the loop extrusion hypothesis had been formulated because it provides an explanation for how uh, a particular orientation can be achieved at these otherwise very far apart uh, loop um, anchors. And the idea here is that these CTCF molecules can somehow function as a boundary for cohesin, but can only do this in an orientation dependent manner. So now, if I understood your, correction, uh, your question correctly, you asked if that's so, how can cohesin form loops at non convergent anchors? And the, the answer is, if I understand the question correctly, that normally that happens extremely rarely, but that does happen much more frequently if one depletes Wackel as first uh, seen by Benjamin Rowland and also by us. And uh, the idea here is, or the implication is, that you need WACL for establishing this so-called convergence rule. And there's an interesting recent paper from Daniel Panne and Benjamin Rowland, uh, which shows that CTCF can compete for binding to reason with WACL. And the implication is that CTCF can therefore protect cohesin from release by WACL. And we have uh, a study uh, using largely uh, fluorescent photobleaching experiments, which also imply that CTCF can protect cohesin from WACL. So the idea is that cohesin will be stopped by CTCF boundaries. Um, and if it arrived in one orientation, it would be more likely to be protected from release by waffle. But if it came from the other side, that would be the thing. And that would explain why if you deplete waffle, you now can anchor chromatin loops also at non-convergent CT set points. Hope that makes sense. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Dinadini. She asks, what do you think is the function of cohesin at the non-cohesive so basically the non-acetylated and not actively maintained the on the chromosome. Uh, maybe we can rephrase the question. Is the question, what's the function of cohesin in forming cis loops and tats? Is that the question? Yes, I think. So she asks what the function of cohesin at the non-cohesive part. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, I mean, yeah, I'm not sure I completely understand the question, but but for many years it was thought that the one and only, or clearly the predominant function uh, of cohesin is to mediate cohesion. But then there were a number of observations which implied that uh, cohesin must be doing other things. Uh, one of them is DNA damage repair, but that is also thought to be mediated by cohesion, which is holding sister chromatids together and allows them to be templates for homologous recombination. But then um, several observations, um, some first made by Dale Dorset and Drosophila implied that cohesin also has a role in gene regulation. And then we found that cohesin is not only present in proliferating cells, but also in post-mitotic differentiated cells. 
which of course do not need cohesion because they will not divide and they're not replicating the DNA. And so based on these initial observations and many later ones, some of which uh, I mentioned in my talk, we think that cohesion is, is sort of the key molecule that folds chromatin fibers into loops and tuts. That clearly has a structural role in organizing the large amount of DNA in chromosomes but it's also thought to have important regulatory functions. For example, there is a series of really exciting publications from Fred Ald in Boston and Minor Buslinger here at the IMP in Vienna, which show that cohesion is essential for recombination of immunoglobulin genes, so-called VDJ recombination, and almost certainly performs this process by folding these gene loci into the huge loops. And by doing so, bringing different gene segments together that are then being recombined. Um, and that recombination is well known to be essential for immunity because it is what creates the, the diversity, as I mentioned, of T-cell receptors, B-cell receptors, um, and antibodies. So we think that these cis interactions, loops and tads, are clearly important um, for, for cellular functions. Does that answer your question? I'm <laughs> not sure I understood the correctly. I think she just asked, uh, what's the function of the non-cohesive cohesins? What is your opinion on that? But yeah. Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, the loop forming co complexes are clearly distinct from the cohesive ones, so they're not cohesive. So that's what we think So the next question is from mm -hmm. Marcel. Uh, the depletion of DNA architectural proteins such as C CTCF has shown surprisingly little impact on gene transcription. Did you observe similar behavior when inferring with cohesion integrity or loading? Yeah, that's a great question, a very important question. Uh, for time reasons, I didn't go into this uh, and just bluntly stated that looping is thought to be important for gene regulation, and that is indeed the case. Uh, and I showed you then now that many loops are dependent on cohesion, but it's also true that if you deplete cohesion or CTCF, then the effects on steady state transcription levels are really modest. Uh, it's typically affecting, depending on, on experiment and cell population and cell type, something like 10% of actively transcribed genes, um, whereas cohesin forms many more loops, affecting many more genes. And so that, I think, could mean either of two things. One, that many enhancer-promoter interactions do not depend on cohesin, or, and that's not mutually exclusive, that the typical cell models that are used for these experiments are not the best to study enhancer functions. So there is evidence from Drosophila genetics, as I mentioned, Dale Dorset's work, um, that uh, NRPBL and cohesin are very important for enhancer promoter interactions during wing development. Uh, there's a very, very interesting study from Matthias Merkenschlager, who showed that macrophage, uh, the response, the, the transcriptional response of macrophages uh, to foreign um, antigens, which induces gene expression, is dependent on cohesin. Um, so under certain conditions in development or during gene induction, um, cohesin clearly has an important role. But if you look at a classical cell culture model like HeLa at steady state, then the effects are modest. And so I suspect that cohesin is required for enhancer promoter looping in some cases, but not all. And that um, we are maybe not always using the best models to study that process from the cohesion field. I mean, in development, of course, people are using um, relevant models, but they have, and, and those, the role of cohesion hasn't been studied um, as intensely. So the next question is, does cohesion choose a mo motive to be bound? Uh, well, indirectly, yes. So cohesion itself, as far as we know, can bind to DNA in a sequence independent manner. We now do believe it binds to DNA, whereas in the old days, the cohesion field, the ring model in particular, proposed that it wouldn't even have to physically contact DNA because it would just form a ring around it. Um, that, I think, was an oversimplification. And instead, it's not quite clear, both from biochemical experiments, but also from three recently published uh, partial cryo-EM structures of cohesion bound to DNA that there are direct physical contacts between multiple subunits of cohesin and NRPBL and DNA. Uh, so for example, NRPBL together with the ATPase heads uh, can form a channel that entraps DNA, as you can see in these cryostructures. Uh, 
Um, but indirectly, there is clearly a preference for particular sequences because cohesin is enriched or, or basically blocked by CTCF. And CTCF has a very clear consensus motif in the genome. And so by accumulating at CTCF sites, cohesin will also accumulate at particular DNA sequences. But not because it binds to these directly or recognizes these directly, but because it's being sort of positioned by CTCF. Great. Um, next question. Are there any diseases associated with the abnormalities in cohesin ring or loop formation? Yeah, there's an, a remarkable number of, of disorders that have been linked to cohesin dysfunction and NPBL dysfunction. Uh, not for all of them it's clear whether these are caused by defects in one or the other function, loop exclusion versus cohesion. So the three uh, best known are a number of human cancers, which are characterized by mutations in cohesin, typically in the so-called STAC2 subunit. Um, then so-called cohesinopathies, which are rare and developmental diseases, congenital diseases leading to defect in limb formation, sometimes mental retardation, sometimes facial deformations. And then the third, um, is, is, is very well known from the work of Molina and her department in Göttingen, uh, are spontaneous abortions, which are believed to be caused by loss, precocious loss of cohesion, in particular in aging oocytes, known as the maternal age effect. Now, the maternal age effect uh, is thought to be a specific defect in cohesion caused by loss of the meiotic version of cohesin containing reg A, and there's no reason to believe at this point that a defect in looping would also contribute, although we can't exclude it, but one doesn't have to assume that. For the mutations that cause either uh, somatic cancers or lead to developmental defects in the cohesinopathies, it's not clear what the molecular defects are, but I think one can safely assume that sister chromatic cohesion under these conditions must still occur because otherwise the tumor cells could proliferate, uh, which is what makes them deadly in the end. Uh, or in case of cohesinopathies, the patients couldn't be born and live, which they do. Without cohesion, that wouldn't be possible. So it must be a defect in some other function of cohesion. And I think with the truth in those two cases is a very strong candidate. It's something we're testing. Uh, using our essay by introducing mutations from these diseases to see whether they would affect the tumor. Um, the next question is, uh, when WAPL inactive, will all cohesin extrude longer? Because cohesin already set their location on chromatin. If all of them extrude longer, they might conflict with each other. What kind of cohesin can extrude longer? Yes, thank you. That's also a good question. Um, we don't know, but we would. I would assume that all complexes that are competent to extrude um, would then do that for longer. Absolutely. Um, those that have established sister commodity cohesion during DNA replication, we don't think are at the same time extruding for a number of reasons. And so they would presumably not be affected. They would just continue to maintain sister chromatic cohesion. Uh, they would do this probably better without WAPL because they, there's no chance of them being released, although they, are, they should be protected from this to some extent by another protein called Sorone. Um, but the ones that are competent in loop extrusion, yes, we would predict we're doing this now for longer. But of course, that's an assumption. Maybe there's no way of, of determining that for every single complex uh, in, a, in a single cell or cell population. But I would say the high C data are consistent with that. It could be that NLPBL becomes rate limiting under those conditions, and that we don't know. Yeah, we're a little bit out of time, uh, but yeah, I'll quickly Sorry go for going over time. some of the questions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I actually asked during the during the talk mm -hmm. that if NIPBL is 
involved only in uh, loading or do you think it, it's maintenance? I think mostly it's uh, answered, but I thought if you have any yeah. new... Yeah, that's data. a great question. Can it, maybe I can briefly answer. No, it's not answered. So if you read the literature, everybody will say NLPDL is part of the loading complex. The fact is that if you inactivate NLPDL, there's very little cohesion on DNA and cells. And that's why people think it's required for loading. And, and, and that, I mean, the phenotype is a fact. That's clear. Um, but we find it suspicious that condensing complexes don't have a loading complex, um, but do have two of these heat repeat proteins binding to glycine. And that's exactly what cohesin has also when it's excluding loops. And it has a stack subunit and an NRPBR subunit is, is, a, is a hawk. It's a heat repeat protein binding to NRPBR, uh, sorry, to glycine. And so it's actually very similar in its active form to the active form of condensing, which doesn't have a loading complex. So I think all the data that we have could also be reinterpreted uh, or would be consistent with the possibility that maybe NRPBL is a processivity factor. It's needed, yes, it's needed to keep cohesion on DNA and, to, and, and allows it to continue doing loop extrusion, but it wouldn't necessarily have to be a special protein that loads cohesion onto DNA. But I think only the future will tell. We need much more mechanistic biochemistry and structural biology work to work this out. And some people would say it's a detail, whether it's loading or maintaining it. We would like to know at some point. <laughs> yeah, great. Uh, the next question is from Anubhav. Could it be that the directionality of movement probed by cohesion mechanical, because that way you could be concurrent with the images where the complex only goes so far along the C slope and then alternates around that position? I'm not sure I understand the question, but um, basically we think that the process of loop extrusion in vitro, as we can reconstitute it uh, under the microscope, is stopped once the loop has been has reached a certain size and the residual DNA that's not in the loop yet gets under tension. And there's beautiful work uh, and false measurements from case Decker for condensing, which also show that. So basically, we think the process would continue possibly endlessly until the reason falls off or until it hits CTCF on the DNA um, if there was more DNA. But once everything is pumped into the loop and the rest is getting under tension, the tension will stop the reason from doing it. That's what we think. But I'm not sure that's answering the question. I'm not sure I understood it um, completely. Okay, thank you again. I think we are running a little out of time for our next talk. So thank you again for your amazing talk and answering all the questions. So thank well. you for all your great uh, questions and your interest. And apologies yeah. for going over time, but uh, thank you for allowing a bit more time so that we could have at least some questions and answers. Yeah, thank you very much. So Good. All the best to the rest of your symposium. And yeah, I hope to see you in cutting one day in person again. Yeah. Thank you again. Good. Thank you.